um, that are in the back window sills here in the nave. There is a copy of, of all of the materials that you will need. Um, and there's another packet that is just the revised version of the bylaws. There's a description of those revisions in the larger packet. Um, so you don't necessarily need the full packet unless you want to, you, you need some bedtime reading going forward. You also need a red and a green voting card. Um, we'll use those when we vote on adopting the new bylaws. Um, and then there's also a sheet back there with a question that we'd like folks to answer about the vision for the property next door. So please do, if you haven't yet, make a trip to the back window sills here in the nave to pick up a copy of those materials. Hello, hello. We are, believe it or not, already a little behind schedule this morning. We were scheduled to start at 9 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and open the meeting with prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present with those who take counsel in St. Andrew's Episcopal Church for the renewal and mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So just in case you came in after I made this announcement a few minutes ago, there are materials that you will need for the meeting in the back window sills of the nave. 
There's a packet with all of the candidate questionnaire responses, an agenda. Um, you'll need that packet. There's also a smaller packet that is the revised bylaws in total, the whole document. Um, if you would like a copy of those, you can pick that up. But in the larger packet, there is a summary of the changes that we've made. So unless you need some bedtime reading, you may well not need the full document, the full copy of the bylaws. You will need a red and a green voting card <clears throat> because when we vote to adopt or whether or not to adopt those amended bylaws, we need a two-thirds majority in order for it to pass. And so we will ask you to use those green and red cards to indicate your vote about those new bylaws. And then there's a third or another document back there with a question about the vision for the property next door once we have moved forward with this process. We'd like you to pick, take a copy of that with you. Feel free to fill it out now or sometime in the next couple of weeks. But please do visit the back window sills in the nave and pick up copies of the materials that you will need. The next thing on our agenda this morning is to identify the parliamentarian for our meeting. Our parliamentarian this morning is Tim O'Shea, who is in the back corner here on the, on the baptistry side of the church. Thank you, Tim, for being willing to serve in that capacity this morning. The next thing on the agenda is the approval of the 2022 annual meeting minutes. Those are in your packet. They start on page two and run through page three. They were sent out by email to the listserv a couple of weeks ago and have been posted on the website. Does anybody have anything they would like to address in the minutes? Changes, adjustments, tweaks. Seeing none, we need a motion to adopt the minutes as presented. I saw Kristen Peterson's hand go up first, and now we need a second. John Mullen's hand went up first. Thank you, John. All in favor of adopting the minutes as presented, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Next on our agenda is a presentation of the, of the report of the nominating committee. Um, that, that report has been published and available online for a couple of weeks, so I'm not going to read it to you. You can be grateful for that. But I will very quickly. Um, this year, we have incumbent junior and senior wardens running for re-election. Junior and senior wardens at St. Andrews are eligible to serve up to three consecutive terms. And for both Casey Reiser and David Paulette, this will be their third term if they are re-elected. No one was nominated to run in those positions, and so we have single candidates in both of those races. For vestry, no one was nominated by the congregation, no one self-nominated, and the nominating committee reached out to a large number of folks. Um, their work um, garnered three candidates for vestry. We have three open seats, so that was great until one of the candidates discovered that their job precluded them from serving on a church board, and they had to withdraw. We made a plea here on Sunday morning and another candidate stepped forward, but because the deadline for nominations had passed, that person will be nominated from the floor at the appropriate moment. To be nominated from the floor, you have to be ready to present everyone at the meeting with a copy of your responses to the candidate questionnaire, and because we had advance notice that this person would be nominated from the floor, their materials are already in the packet, so you have them before you. Diocesan convention. At this past convention, the con convention approved a resolution to move forward with conversations about reuniting the three Episcopal dioceses in the state of Wisconsin. A tremendous amount of work 
background and prep went into that vote. And so the four people who served as our diocesan convention deputies this past October are running again this year so that they can bring their experience and all of that background information to the table at a special convention in May of next year when we will vote on final documents about or final documents to reunify those three dioceses. So those folks are running for re-election both for next fall's diocesan convention and for the special convention in May. We need to elect them twice. We didn't know that until just a couple of weeks ago when the diocese sent out instructions saying, please do clearly elect those folks to serve at the special convention and then have another election to elect people to serve at diocesan convention. So we will elect the same slate of candidates twice this morning. You may note that there is no one running for endowment committee this year. Um, we have before us in the proposed resolution to amend the bylaws um, a way to change the, the structure and the membership of the endowment committee, moving those tasks to the executive committee of the vestry. Um, if that resolution passes, it would have been strange to ask someone to run for a position that will no longer exist minutes after they are elected. So we didn't ask anyone to do that. If the resolution to amend the bylaws does not pass, we have two people on the committee now whose terms have not expired, and the vestry will appoint someone to fill that third seat on the endowment committee going forward. As we do every year, we had a long period asking folks to nominate people for these leadership positions and to nominate themselves. The, the vestry appointed a nominating committee, which is always made up of folks in their second year of service on the vestry. And so it's through all of that work that the slate comes before you this morning. And so now we'll move forward to the actual election itself. But before we do that, I'd like to offer a prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks to you for all whom you call to serve your church. We give thanks for those whose terms of service are now ending. We give thanks for those who today stand before this congregation willing to serve. Guide our hearts and our minds as we elect new leadership for the coming year. Be with those who are elected and with those who are not. Help us to recognize that the gift is in the offering and that everyone on today's ballot is a testimony to your presence and power in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So another quick addendum or excursus here. Um, we have not handed out ballots this morning. And that's because in all of the elections before us this morning, we have only enough folks standing for election that we need to fill the available seats. And so barring nominations from the floor, all of the races this morning are uncontested. And so we will elect by acclamation the slate. If, however, someone is nominated from the floor, we do have ballots prepared and we are ready for that contingency. So moving forward, first item on our ballot is the election of a senior warden. Our bylaws state that a senior warden is elected for one year term and that a person may hold that office for three consecutive terms. It's my pleasure to tell you that Casey Reiser, who has served as senior warden for the last two years, has agreed to run for a third term. At this moment, there are no other candidates. Are there any nominations from the floor? There being none, Casey Reiser is the only candidate. Therefore, I ask that we vote by acclamation to affirm Casey Reiser's election as our next senior warden all in favor, please say aye. aye.
Thank you, Casey. And now, I'll turn the floor over to you. <laughs> Okay, um, I know David's here. I saw him. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just, I'm just checking. I'm just checking. Um, our the next item on the ballots is the election of a junior warden. Our bylaws state that a junior warden is elected for a one-year term, and that person may hold that office for three consecutive years. It is my pleasure to tell you that David Pallett, who has served as junior warden for the last two years, has agreed to run for a second term. Third term. Fourth term, third term. <laughs> oh, I thought I'd change that. At this moment, there are no other candidates. Are there any nominations from the floor? Sorry, David. <laughs> Strike that from the minutes. <laughs> there being none, David Pallette is the only candidate. Therefore, I ask that we vote by acclamation to affirm David Pallette's election as our next junior warden. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Congrat yes. <laughs> Congratulations, and thank you, David. We move now to the election of members to serve on the vestry. Finishing three-year terms on the vestry are Aaron Gosser, John Mullen, Katie Terry. Thank you, Aaron, John, and Katie. We are electing three people to serve three-year terms on the vestry. The highest vote-getters will serve the three-year terms. The candidates are Ryan Brown, David Johnson, Ann Keller, and actually, um, David needs to be nominated from the floor. Any nominations from the floor? I nominate David Johnson for election as a member of the vestry. Uh, okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so I ask that we elect Ryan Brown, David Johnson, and Ann Keller to the vest. What? Oh, any additional nominations <laughs> from the floor? That, that's not in the script. I just want you to know. <laughs> Any other nominations from the floor? All right. There being none, I ask that we elect Ryan Brown, David Johnson, and Ann Keller to the vestry by acclamation. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right. Congratulations. I'm now turning it over to <laughs> Since Casey is on the slate for the, this next role, we figured it would be better if I came back up for this piece of the election. We now move to the election for, of four people to serve as diocesan deputies, or de, as the, hmm, hmm, deputies to diocesan convention. The candidates for election this morning are Carolyn Chatterton, Stephanie Elkins, Karen Evans Romaine, and Casey Reiser. They also served, as I said, as our deputies this past year. Are there any additional nominations from the floor? Seeing none, our candidates are Carolyn Chatterton, Stephanie Elkins, Karen Evans Romaine, and Casey Reiser. And I ask that we elect this slate by acclamation. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations, we have just concluded the, nom or the elections for the 2023 annual meeting. Okay, the next item on our agenda this morning is a presentation of the State of the Parish Report. Last year, I stood in this spot and described us as being in liminal time and liminal space. We were no longer what we were, what we had been, and who we were becoming had not yet come into focus. The pandemic had changed us and changed the church, its place and role in our culture and society, 
And it wasn't clear that those shifts and changes had settled into a new normal. In the midst of those shifting sands, it wasn't apparent who we were called to be and how we should respond to the call of the gospel in this new landscape. As I stand here today, I'm not sure that we've arrived at that new normal. I think that we'll be seeing the impact of these last few years playing out before us for quite some time. And I don't think any of us can predict where and when all of the pieces will fall back into place. But I do think that we are beginning to see new patterns emerging. I think that we're at that point where we can start to adapt, to strategize about the future without the fear that we'll have the rug pulled out from under us again tomorrow. I think that we're ready to explore with some confidence who we are called to be and how to respond to the call of the gospel. And in fact, we've already begun that process. Who are we called to be? What are we called to do? Let's just take a look at the last year. Last year in the depths of winter, a new group was forming here at St. Andrews. With a grant that had been given in the waning months of 2022, the Flower Guild held a training event, bringing in a floral designer to teach the basics of flower arranging and began a series of community building events. Leadership for this new group stepped up. A member of our community who owns a flower farm offered to donate flowers and people signed up to drive to the farm and bring the flowers back to Madison. Members of the Flower Guild share photos of their arrangements with the rest of the group, often work in teams of two, and support one another in the work that they do. They've become a community, developing friendships as they work side by side here at St. Andrews. The Flower Guild and the Altar Guild, long an established community here among us, began to gather on a regular basis for a beer and a burger. An opportunity to gather with no other reason than to get to know each other and to nurture and develop the friendships that they share. Burgers and beer. Hey, men's group, are you listening? <laughs> this year, we've also made real headway in resurrecting coffee hour. It's been a while, or it's taken a while, for us to return to the parish hall for conversation and fellowship on Sunday mornings. When we started to gather in person as the pandemic lifted, gatherings like coffee hour still felt like something of a risk. But we have more and more people coming downstairs after church on Sunday mornings, eager to pick up on last week's conversations or begin new ones with new people. Folks are signing up to provide food for the feast, and the guests are arriving, eager for the fellowship for which St. Andrew's is famous. This year, we brought back foyers, groups of six or eight that gather in one another's homes for a meal and an opportunity to get to know each other in ways that aren't possible in the time and space available at coffee hour. Gathered around a table, sharing stories, discovering commonalities, recognizing shared interests, values, and dreams. This is what has made foyers such a valuable part of our common life and why it feels so significant that it's once again a part of the fabric of our community. Just this past month, we hosted a Meet the Artist Night at St. Andrews. Members of our own community, gifted and talented artists of all stripes, set up in the parish hall to share their passion with our community. We learned things about one another that night that we might never have expected, saw the gleam in people's eyes as they shared their art with folks who were genuinely delighted and amazed at their talents. Art. Did, did I mention art? The gallery wall in the parish hall has long displayed the work of artists, both members of St. Andrew's and from the wider community. But this year, we've added something new. Artists who display their work are invited to a reception where folks from St. Andrews and the wider community can come to hear about their artistic process, their journey as an artist, and the unique vision 
that makes their art their own. These receptions provide yet another opportunity for us to come to know one another more deeply and to find ourselves on a common path here at St. Andrews. Who are we? What are we called to do? St. Andrews has long been known for the depth and strength of its community. People new to St. Andrews often tell me that as soon as they come through the doors of this place, they can tell that people here care about and like one another. In this, in this new place and time, that kind of community is increasingly hard to find. The pandemic weakened our social skills, those muscles atrophied, and it seems harder than ever to put ourselves out there to find new friends, to try new places and activities than it used to. Increasing polarization around social and political issues in our country have made finding and building community even harder. In a time and place like this, the gift of community is sorely needed, and it is one in which we, St. Andrews, are investing time, energy, and resources. So this is probably a good moment to point towards our new mission statement, a mission statement that this community crafted to both describe who we are and to shape what we will do going forward, a mission statement presented and developed at the annual meeting just a year ago. All are welcome. Nourished by God's love, we follow Christ's example of service to each other and our community. That's who we say we are. That's what we say we are about. All are welcome, nourished by God's love. We are working to live that out in this time and place by building and offering a community of deep connection and support where people know that they are welcome and safe. But what about the second half of that mission statement? We follow Christ's example of service to each other and our community. Let's look at how we're living into that part of who we are. This year, the Vestry adopted a liaison program in which members of the Vestry serve the different ministry groups at St. Andrews working to facilitate their ministries and to keep all of us informed about the many moving parts of our community. The Vestry liaisons hope to make connections between ministries who are working in the same vineyard, helping us all to work collaboratively and efficiently and to lower the barriers to participation by documenting processes and procedures within the ministries themselves. Clearly marked points of entry, good descriptions of the ministries, their goals and activities, a handbook, if you will, that means we aren't constantly reinventing the wheel will benefit us all by allowing us to more freely offer our gifts and talents, finding vocation in our life together, here and in the communities we serve. One way that vocation plays out at St. Andrews is through our commitment to the community around us. This yet past year, through our outreach in gatherings, St. Andrews has given over $34,000 to ministries in our community. We've developed strong ties and relationships with the Grace Food Pantry and with Own It, and the majority of those funds went to those two ministries, but we also gave to the social work department at West High School and to Madison Roots in this past year. Through the discretionary fund, Members of this community gave over $6,500 to support people in crisis, providing rental and utility assistance, assistance with medical bills, medications, and emergency auto repairs. $6,500. You add that to the $34,000, and St. Andrews has given over 41, or around $41,000 to serve the community around us. That shouldn't surprise you, 
Because last year, we gave just about the same figure. And every year, we do that again and again. Vocation. The exercise and gifts and talents for the good of, commu of the community takes place here at home, too. And this year, the vestry committed money from our cash reserves and from the Memorial Gifts Fund to engage paid section leaders in the choir. Now, we all know that in this day and age, having the funds for a position doesn't necessarily guarantee candidates will come knocking at our door, and it's proven more difficult than we imagined to find the right people to support our choir as they support us in worship on Sunday mornings. But the investment of resources represents a recognition of the centrality of music to our identity in this place, and it represents a commitment to support the work that our music director, Ken Stancer, and the members of our choir offer on our behalf. All are welcome. Nourished by God's love, we follow Christ's example of service to each other and our community. All are welcome, nourished by God's love. This fall, we've taken steps to be sure that all members of our community are welcome and have the opportunity to be nourished by God's love. Last week, our nursery reopened. And we have four wonderful UW students who are excited to be here with us, caring for and extending God's love to the youngest of our parish family on Sunday mornings. And more and more folks have reached out to me in the last couple of weeks saying how excited they are to have that option and how much it will enhance their experience of Sunday mornings to have the ability to take their children downstairs to the nursery during worship. In addition, an express gift by a former parishioner has allowed us to seek, and I am very pleased to be able to tell you, extend a job offer to a highly qualified and exciting candidate for a part-time children, youth, and family ministries coordinator. They have accepted the offer, and I will meet with them tomorrow morning at 9.30 to cross all the T's and dot all the I's. And once that letter of agreement is inked, we will do the big reveal and introduce the newest member of our staff. If we were hiring someone to manage the church school, the youth group, the family ministries program as it now exists, we would have been searching for someone to fill maybe a 10 to 14 hour a week job, a job that we have been advertising for a long time with no applicants coming forward. But because of Janet Hyde's gift, we are able to invite someone to a 20 hour a week job, a much more attractive position, and one which will help us to explore new ways of gathering our children and youth, new ways of engaging their whole families and new ways of sharing with them the richness of our faith and tradition, the treasure that we have in clay pots, the love of God poured out for all. You've heard me talk about this position, a 20-hour-a-week children, youth, and family ministries coordinator, as staffing for mission and growth. The position is designed for a program that we hope to grow into, not for who and what we are, but for who and what we hope to be and become. And I think that concept, the idea of staffing for mission and growth, budgeting for mission and growth, are key to the state of the parish in 2023. In 2023, the pace of change, the level of disruption have eased, eased and some patterns are emerging. One of them is apparent every Sunday morning. Our average attendance year to date in 2023 offers, differs from our year to date attendance at this time last year by only three people. There's a pattern emerging. 
In 2019, our average Sunday attendance was 137. Last year, it was 91. And this year, it's likely to be in the 90s again. We are smaller than we were, and it's natural. It's good for us to want to grow, to see the pews full on Sunday morning, to hear more children's voices in the pews, and to find the parish hall filled with people at coffee hour. I think that we need to make this coming year one where we focus our attention and intention, our resources and energy on mission and growth. But please note that I put mission before growth, and that's a key sequence. Mission. The Catechism says that the mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. We do that work by honoring our baptismal vows, by seeking and serving Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourselves, and by striving for justice and peace among all people, respecting the dignity of every human being. Doing this work requires that we be nourished by God's love, that we have a community of deep love, care, and support that will help us to find the way forward, that we have a place to which we can come for comfort, solace, companionship, and training. Doing this work requires that we all do our part to keep this community strong, spirit-filled, and alive it requires that we live into another of our baptismal vows to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers. Growth. We want to grow. We want people to come and discover what we have found, to hear the life-giving message of Jesus Christ and the truth that we are all loved without reservation or demand, that nothing we can ever do will cause God to abandon us, that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And we know that we are enriched that the fabric of our community becomes more beautiful with every person who joins us. We grow when we live into another of those promises that we renew every time there's a baptism in this place by proclaiming by word and example the good news of God in Christ. Why do we come to church on Sunday mornings? Why do we participate in foyers? Why do we prepare flowers and clean and iron linens for the altar? Why do we come to choir rehearsal every Thursday night and then come back early on Sunday morning to rehearse some more and then help lead the community in worship? Why do we give to the Grace Food Pantry and to own it? Why do we write thank you notes to own it ambassadors and Christmas cards to people who are incarcerated in our state? We can engage in mission. We can work to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. But we aren't going to grow if we don't tell people why we're doing it. I know it's a hard thing to do. It can be scary to tell someone that you are a part of a faith community and that your faith is an important aspect of who you are and what you do. It can be hard to broach that topic with your own family, let alone your coworkers, friends, or people you encounter socially. But my friends, this is the time for us to staff, to budget, to commit to mission and growth. What, what is the state of the parish of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in 2023? We are poised, and as you will hear a little later this morning, fiscally sound, staffed for mission and growth, ready to engage as we slowly emerge from the liminal time and space that was thrust upon us we are committing our resources, our energy, to staffing and budgeting, to living into our baptismal covenants. And we are placing our hope, 
our faith, on our dedication to mission and growth, living in to that new mission statement. St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, all are welcome. Nourished by God's love, we follow Christ's example of service to each other and to our community. Thank you. Boy, we've been busy. I never heard it all in one thing. Thank you all for that. Um, I am going to briefly talk about the bylaws revisions before we vote on it. Um, the narrative that's in the packet details most of the uh, details all of the changes that were made. Um, and most of them were formatting, clarifying, things of that nature. The biggest change is the structure of the endowment committee, and I want to spend a few minutes on that before I open it for questions. A revision to the structure of the endowment committee came about because of a recommendation from the endowment committee. It wasn't anyone else's um, thought. And in fact, their recommendation initially was to do away with the endowment committee because it was more detailed than what we as a parish have needed. Um, it was decided that that was probably not a, a good idea and, because we do have two fairly large endowments. Um, and so rather we restructured the endowment committee. Things that are the same is we are keeping an endowment committee. The members of that endowment committee are permanent members, if you will, by position. The rector, the junior warden, and the senior warden. And so those, of course, will change over time, and two of those are elected positions. There is still an opportunity to involve other parish members who may be appointed for help as needed. But I also think one of the most important things about the restructuring is what has remained the same. And that is that approval for grant requests comes from the vestry. The endowment committee only made recommendations to the vestry. That's true before, that would be true in this new restructuring. Um, and so I think that that's an important piece. Basically, we wanted to simplify the process and the endowment committee wanted to simplify the process. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say about that before opening it for questions and then having a vote. And that's when we'll use the green and the red cards. Okay. Sherry, who is on the endowment committee. <laughs> Somebody just brought me a note about that, so we'll do that in a second. Thank you. I think, thank you, Sherry, for saying that. One of the um, added things from this year, the vestry liaison uh, structure, 
um, means that there are vestry members who are able to help facilitate someone who's interested in writing a, a grant or someone who's interested in developing an idea. And either your senior warden or your rector can certainly direct you to the right vestry liaison person um, to help with those ideas. Casey, would you just share how we approached revising the bylaws and who we engaged to help oh, us do that? Oh, yes. Um, the bylaws revisions, um, because it was really a big undertaking, because it was an overall look at the big picture of the bylaws and going through every page for grammar, duplications, inaccuracies uh, when compared with the um, diocesan canons. Um, there was really a, a much bigger than certainly I could do. It was certainly a bigger ask than we could ask anyone from the parish to do. So I reached out to the diocese. They made a recommendation of three firms who would do this kind of work, um, and we engaged one of those firms. Um, to do the work of revising the bylaws, which turned out to be a very good thing um, because the, the details that, have, that are involved um, and that structure is really important, and I certainly couldn't have done it. Okay. Um, do you want to explain how this vote works? Because <laughs> I don't really know. Green and red cards. So to adopt a, an amendment to the bylaws requires a two-thirds majority of the people present to vote this morning. Our parliamentarian just pointed out to me that we do have a quorum. In fact, we are well above the threshold for establishing a quorum. So what we need to do this morning is to vote, count the total number of votes, and then divide by thirds and make sure that two of those thirds were voted, voted to approve the amendment. <laughs> um, so what we'll ask you to do is, in just a moment is to hold up a green card to vote to adopt. Our tellers will make their way from the front to the back of the church, counting the green cards in each pew. Once they've counted you, they'll ask you to lower your card um, and they'll make their way to the back. They'll tally their numbers and report out. Then we'll do the same thing with the red cards to, to vote to not adopt the amendment. Is that all clear? All right. Andy Porter, did you? Anyone need a red and a green card? Sherry does up front. <clears throat> <laughs> Joe. Okay, I, it appears that we're ready to vote. All in favor of adopting the amended bylaws as presented, please raise a green card. Are you confident in your math? <laughs> and how many green cards did you count? 50. 50. Thank you very much. Okay, now would you please raise a red card if you're voting against adoption of the revised bylaws? Let, let the notes, <laughs> the minutes, <laughs> note that the motion to adopt the amended bylaws was, a, was approved unanimously.
But before David comes up to talk about the Newell House, um, I did say that we needed to vote twice to elect our diocesan convention deputies, once to our diocesan convention and once to the special convention in April, and then I completely forgot about all of that. So we're not done voting yet. I'm going to rule that we have elected them to serve at the diocesan convention in October, and now I'd like to ask that we vote by acclamation to elect that same slate of candidates to represent us at the special convention on May the 4th next year. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. T's crossed, I's dotted, we're on a roll. David, you're up. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, two matters of business before I get into the matters of business here. First of all, how many people do we have watching online? You don't know? It's just because if we have a conversation, I want to make sure that we do use the microphones so that people online can hear us as well. Uh, secondly, I am noting that we are 10 minutes to 10. We are woefully behind the agenda time. And at the, um, I'm going to take a risky move here in uh, Casey. Give me two minutes to do a uh, preamble here, so you keep me on time today. You're keeping time for me right now, that's right. Um, I am not going to go too in-depth about the Newell House per se. Um, there's a lot of information about it in the Junior Warden Report, which hopefully you've had a chance to read or skim in one way or the other. A uh, couple things I want to say, and I'm going to open it up for conversation after that. Um, and I want, I want to work off of something that Father Andy said this morning, is that uh, a lot of our theme right now is budgeting and planning for our mission and our growth. And part of doing that budgeting and planning process uh, means that we have to assess the gifts and the assets that we have as a church. And how do we best utilize those as we think about our mission and our growth as a congregation and as a parish? Over the past year, we have spent a fair amount of time with a number of people uh, in this parish uh, who have been looking at the Newell House and the Newell House property um, to take a look to see how that's going to fit into our long-term vision and to our plan. The, uh, we started by doing an overall assessment about the, the state of the property, and, uh, and as, as a result of that, we realized that we had a couple of uh, safety issues that were related to the Newell House, uh, mostly in the backyard area. The other thing that is actually worth noting is that since the pandemic, we, we have been still trying to use the house for some programming, uh, but in reality, there hasn't been a whole lot of programming needs that have been able to go into that house. And at the present moment, uh, the house is not being used for any programming activities related to St. Andrews at this moment. Um, as, as we did that assessment, we tried to understand a little bit about the costs of remediating some of those issues that we saw out there and what we should be thinking about in terms of that property as a whole. Last uh, spring, we had our uh, parish meeting and we started to talk about the property and started to set up listening sessions and we've engaged many of you to give us, a feed, to give us feedback about that property and how we should think about that property and how that does fit into our mission as a whole. And um, as a result of those listening sessions that we conducted over the summer, uh, we believe that we heard a fairly consistent theme. It wasn't universal, it was not uh, unanimous, but it was a consistent theme that the building itself uh, may not be in our best interest to keep, but that the property would be a very valuable thing for us as we think about our mission and our growth strategy. We gave those results back to the vestry, and they have asked us to form a new committee. Uh, so this is our third committee in one, in one year, so we're very excited about that. Um, I guess that makes us Trinitarians. And um, so this committee has actually been uh, charged with taking a look at what it's going to take for us to clear the property and to start to establish a vision for it when it comes to uh, our mission and our growth as a parish into the, into the future as well. Uh, there are a lot of steps that we're going to be going through. I've outlined many of them in the Junior Warden Report, uh, and we have been very active in collecting information about what it's, going to talk, what it's going to potentially cost, what's going to be involved with clearing the property, and one of the things that we do want to spend a couple of minutes on this morning 
is to uh, kick off the process about visioning the property as well. Did I do that in two minutes? Yes. Okay. No, you didn't even. You didn't. You didn't even pay attention. You didn't even keep time. All right. Um, I am going to pause my remarks there because uh, hopefully many of you have been engaged and have heard a lot of this over the course of the past year. And I want to pause right now to take uh, any questions that you have. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And then uh, Steve will be coming over with a microphone for you. So, oh, one moment. Oh, hey. Yes, I've been wondering what the city of Madison has to say about it. It's uh, been going a, on for a long, long time. Yep. Uh, that, that is a great question, and that is actually one of the very important things that we're going to have to work through as we go through this, which is what the city of Madison is. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Would you uh, say your, uh, I don't even remember. No, oh, uh, Donna Peterson, okay. Um, there is a, that is one of the, one of the areas that uh, we are going to have to uh, work through with the city of Madison. We know that there are uh, two organizations that have to give approval to doing this. One of those is the city of Madison, the other one is the diocese. We're obviously also gonna engage the uh, neighborhood as a whole. Um, it is, I think, premature to say exactly what the city of Madison is going to say because we believe it's, uh, it behooves us to put together a plan of what that property might look like to have that full conversation with the city. But we are aware that there are certain requirements that relate to it being a historical district and the state of the house, and uh, we are committed to working through that and determining if that is going to be a barrier or if there's a way to work through that with the city of Madison. Excellent question, and that's the first question everybody asks me, so I appreciate you uh, keeping that consistent for me. Yes, Suzanne. You had mentioned that there are some other groups outside of An St. Andrews that use that building. I know AA has some meetings there. Uh, are we thinking about accommodating them within the parish hall or within the... Of the rest of yep. the campus. Yeah, so in terms of accommodating other groups that, that, um, that have used that, one of them was a group from West High School. It was a temporary use of that particular space. Uh, another group that has actually been using it very consistently has been uh, the AA group. We have actually uh, already uh, started to accommodate having them come into the parish space so that they can meet here instead. So we've created some uh, opportunities for that. I think the Boy Scouts was the other group that was intermittently using it, and then we would also make the accommodations in this space uh, if they would like to use it as well. Any other questions? Oh, yep, uh, up here. <clears throat> And Alan, um, it, we have very limited parking for staff and so on. Is it possible that we could include on that property some, like one or two parking spaces for staff or for handicapped? Well, I, I, I tell you, um, that may be an excellent segue to the next part of this conversation here, because okay. part of what we, part, we believe that part of the function of this committee is to help to vision what that space might look like how we might want to use that particular space. Um, and uh, to that end, I'm gonna ask uh, Casey to reemerge and talk a little bit about the next activity that we're gonna do because that's absolutely gonna be part of the discussion and dialogue moving forward. Um, as David had sa has said, the idea of visioning of what that adjacent property can be and how can that can help us with our mission is a really important part of this process and it has to be going on simultaneously with other fact finding. To begin that, that's one of the sheets that um, was in the back windows. Please, if anyone doesn't have one, raise your hand and, and Andy can give you one. We are just beginning what this vision, visioning process will be um, with this today. We didn't have time to include discussion groups, et cetera, which we wanted to. But the ideas that you give us and those we've had from previous discussions 
will help us begin that process because we want to be very inclusive. We want your ideas of what is the best way to use that property adjacent to this building. Um, and so, as you can see in these directions, please write, oops, Barb Peterman just raised her hand. Um, please write down your ideas. No idea is too big, no idea is too small. We also have to think in terms of short term, what might we be able to do with our resources at the moment, and long term, what do we potentially see being as part of that property? And Anne, I will tell you that one of the things that has come up over and over is some way to make the building more accessible. That doesn't mean a concrete parking lot for the whole thing, but is there a way that we can have greater accessibility through a bit more creative arrangement of that property? That's just one idea. There are many, many others, but we want to hear them from you, and we will use these to create other discussion groupings um, that everyone will be invited to. Barb. Barb Peterman. Casey and the rest, I feel as if we need to go to the city first to find out what parameters they have or constraints they might have before we acknowledge and have all these grandiose ideas and then we can't do them. Which is partly why I said no idea is too big or too small, but also we've had that discussion, Barb, because it does seem, are we putting the cart before the horse, if you will? But timing issues really say that some of these things have to be done at the same time. Otherwise, we will be having this conversation two years from now, because working with the city and getting other estimates and finding out, um, and I'll let David speak to this as well, is going to take a lot of time. And so we want to be able to do them simultaneously so that we're not just taking baby steps along the way. Do you have anything else? Yeah, uh, I think, Barb, just to add on to that very briefly, um, the city of Madison is like any other uh, institution. It's got a lot of different tentacles to it, a lot of different uh, groups that may have different opinions. Um, there is some historical precedent to believe that there is going to be, uh, that we can work with the city in order to execute whatever plans we feel are the most appropriate for clearing the property and doing that. That being said, if we end up with a complete stonewall from the city of Madison saying that we can't do this, we will adapt accordingly. I didn't say this before, maybe you did. One of the things we've realized is that in going to the city, we can't just say we want to do this or this, or we need to have some sort of pl plan of what we might want to do. We're not talking a detailed plan about this amount of square footage for this and this amount of square footage for that. It's more of that vision because they're going to want that from us as well is what we've learned. If something happens to the Newell House in the meantime, while these plans are being made, what has happened? Um, do we have any like case studies of other um, things that have happened in the past? So, like, um, have other um, people who have dealt with historic buildings? So, it, the historic building falls apart. Then, what has happened to their project? Um, I don't believe that we have the case studies specifically that you're. Uh, Referencing, we, uh, we're in the process of doing some of that fact gathering right now about what happens with historical buildings. We do, the, I think from a broad standpoint, we do know that in other historical districts, the city has given permission to remove a pr piece of property and replace it uh, with something else, but we need to do our due diligence along that as well, and that's part of what we're doing. And then I think we have a question from Larry up here. And we are woefully behind on agenda. I get that, but... The <laughs> Larry Beckler. Um, as time passes by, fewer people know that the Newell House became the property of the parish by the purchase by a former rector 
as a living quarters for a longtime uh, parish member, Gertrude Wilson. Has anybody researched whether at the time of the gift of the property to the parish, there were any strings on the deed or deed restrictions or anything like that? Because clearly we don't want to run into anything like that. So actually that's the, the common narrative that Bob Shaw purchased the house. But vestry records indicate that the parish took out a loan to buy that house and that Bob Shaw paid off the remainder of the debt on that loan when he left. Um, with the stipulation that he was giving that gift to the parish with the requirement that Gertrude be allowed to live in that building for the rest of her life. So that was the only, only string. And he didn't pay the full amount for the purchase of the house. He just paid off the remainder of the debt when he left. So as far as I can tell from all of the, the vestry minutes and notes that we have in the archives, there are no strings on that property. Okay. Yes. That's a great point. A um, lot of great discussion. I feel like uh, we could probably go on for another uh, 25 minutes, at which point we would all have to stay for the 1030 service. So I'm going to turn it back over to Father Andy so that we can move along. But uh, you can always uh, reach out to myself um, it, or, or others uh, if you have further comments about the Newell House. So in your packet, there are several printed reports, and we have 10 minutes on the agenda for questions about those reports. What I would like to do is to spend, suspend that period of questions and use the time right now to hear the financial reports from our treasurer, and then at the end of his presentation, we'll field questions about both the financials and the written reports, if you all have them. So, Kevin, you're up. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kevin Featherston Crow, the parish uh, treasurer. I am going to be brief this morning for obvious reasons not the least of which is I think I'm the only choir member left who hasn't gone downstairs yet. Um, so, as Father Andy said earlier, the state of the parish financial condition is sound, and that was true at the end of 2022 as well as it is today. Um, we'll touch on numbers here in just a moment, but before I do, I just want to give you some high-level uh, changes that we've gone through in the uh, finance arena this year. Uh, during Father Andy's comments earlier, um, Casey whispered to me, boy, we've been busy. And I'm like, yep. And I'm going to add some more things to that list of, of how we have grown and changed this year. Um, at the end of last year, we found that our previous accounting firm was not able to continue offering accounting services to us. So one of the changes this year that was put through in a very fast manner was our transition from our old accounting service to a new one called Mission Accounting, which is run by an Episcopal deacon here in the diocese, and uh, that firm serves many different parishes here. We've also, as part of that transition, uh, transitioned our accounting software from an older um, standalone piece of software to uh, an online piece of software. It's much more modern, it's much more easy to use, and in the event that we need to make another transition to another accounting firm in the future, it will be very portable. So we've invested in that uh, for future growth. Um, thanks to the CFO for the Diocese of Milwaukee, Caroline Sen, we've done a complete top-to-bottom review of our accounting structure, the way in which we make records. Uh, she simplified and cleaned up and consolidated, and we're very grateful for her um, help on that. Uh, it was at no cost to us, but it streamlined all of our accounting records as well, and that makes, um, makes my job and, and the vestry's job and everybody's job a lot easier, Dylan and Father Andy. <clears throat> and then finally, one other large uh, change this year. 
For me, this is new, maybe it's a return to a normal for some others, but we've reestablished the Finance Committee. Um, their purpose is to um, more thoughtfully craft a budget, more than just one person with a spreadsheet, uh, and, other, and offer other investment options for the vestry to consider. So this process of crafting the budget that we'll review here in a moment um, will be, because we have not, you'll hear in a minute, finished the process, uh, but done more thoughtfully and more um, in line with the um, growth and mission goals that were mentioned earlier. So to start off just some numbers, which I know is everybody's favorite part here. Um, the first thing on, it's in your packet, towards the end, you'll see the statement of financial position, that's our balance sheet. And just for, for a brief review here, we ended 2022 with $4.1 million in assets. Most of that is in the buildings and that never changes, the building, the, the, the church, and the Newell House next door. Uh, the changing aspects are the current assets, mostly the bank accounts. We ended uh, cash on deposit in 2022 of $360,878, and other assets which include investments and the endowment and trust funds of $353,234. Also at the end of 2022, we had total liabilities, which are usually just transactions in process, um, whether it's um, um, uh, uh, payroll transactions or, um, oh my gosh, it's escaping me at the moment, uh, giving activities that just have to be paid out to the recipients at this time. Uh, we ended the year at $20,646. Uh, that left equity, in the balance sheet, $4,086,277. Moving forward, staying on the balance sheet to September of this year, so we report to you the most recent quarter end, very similar yet growing, we increased our assets $39,894 to $4.146 million. Again, fixed assets don't change, that means that assets in bank accounts and investments grew. We increased our bank accounts to 386,000, and we increased our other assets, those trust and endowment funds, to 366,500. That means, and as of September 30th, we also had liabilities of $16,149. So our equity also grew to 4.130 million. I want to draw your eye back up to the bank accounts line for just a moment. By practice, I'm not sure if policy is the right word, uh, we keep three months of excess, I'm sorry, three months of cash reserves on hand for future cash needs. For September 30th, three months of budgeted cash reserves is $123,000. The bank accounts include some designated funds, so we subtract that out, and we have cash reserves on hand of 233,000. And this, these numbers are at the bottom of the balance sheet. Sorry if I did not point that out. When we subtract the three month requirement from what we actually have on hand, we have excess cash reserves of 109,421. So this goes to the fact that we are in very safe, very good financial position and actually are well ahead of where we need to be in order to maintain our three-month reserve. I'm going to refer back to that in just a moment when we start talking about the budget, but before we do that, I just want to go through the uh, prior year and year-to-date budget and income statements, which start on the next page of your packet. I know there's a lot of numbers here, and there's actually, in reality, a whole lot more than what's shown on these pages. These are presented to you in a summarized way, just so that we can have this conversation. I forgot to mention this earlier. If anybody does want more detail, it is available to you. Just reach out to me or to Father Andy. We can make that available to you. Um, as well as at vestry meetings, this is discussed in much more detail. The vestry takes their stewardship of the budget and the finances very seriously, and this is a very uh, detailed topic of conversation at meetings. So anyone is welcome to attend those as well. Uh, for 2022, I'm just going to direct you to the first column on the income statement page. We ended income at 2022 of $516,000. 
and going to the bottom of the next page, which is where the expenses are shown, or it's labeled expenditures, we had total expenditures of $434,690. There's some other revenue and expenditures that are sort of miscellaneous listed after that, but basically take the revenue, subtract the expenditures, also adjust for those other revenue and expenditure numbers, and we ended with net revenue in 2020 of $80,478. For this year, and this is again through September 30th, we've had total revenue of 375,000 and total expenditures of 334,000. You will see that there is um, other revenue and other expenditures listed as well. We had some additional Newell House expenses, and we are now, thanks to Caroline Sen and her work on uh, uh, correcting some of our accounting records, accounting for changes in the values of the endowment and trust funds. Those numbers are listed here in other revenue as well. So again, doing our math of taking total revenue, subtracting total expenditures, and adding and subtracting those other adjustments, as of September 30th, we had net revenue to the positive side of $40,943. In the next column, you'll see that our budget numbers, and these are year to date, so we just take the total year and it's three quarters of the total year to get us to September 30th. Our revenue, 371,000, that was what's budgeted. So we are ahead of budget in terms of total revenue by about $4,000 or so. And on expenditures, we had budgeted 370,000 in expenditures, but have only seen 334. So adding, subtracting, and et cetera, we budgeted through the end of September a net loss of $1,112. So we are well ahead of budget this year. Some of those shortages on the expenditures are due to open positions that have not yet been filled, yet were budgeted for uh, the entire calendar year. So there's a little bit of timing aspect of this as well. The next column is where we project our budget and our finances to be at the end of this year. Now, since we've just transitioned to new accounting software, we have not been able to become more sophisticated in this than simply taking what we have seen for the last nine months, divide by nine, and multiply by 12. It's just a straight line expansion, basically, of what we've seen. Hopefully, that can become more sophisticated in the, in the, the years to come. But looking forward, uh, that we are projecting at this point um, net revenue, the bottom line, excess revenue over expenditures of $76,717. So very, a very healthy year-end 2023 is projected. I will note that of that 76,000, that includes the gifts that were referred to earlier, uh, which are shown on your, um, uh, on your income statement at the very top in revenue, the donations, the prayer book donations and the children and family ministries coordinator donation. That's part of those projections. So those projections also include not just our uh, normal budget, but some unexpected revenues that we didn't anticipate when this was put together earlier this year. The next column just shows you where we budgeted earlier this year for 2023. And then finally, the next column is the proposed budget for 2024. And proposed is a very loose term there. This is the very beginning of the crafting of the 2024 budget. This is very speculative, it will change. The Finance Committee, like I said, getting off the ground and running, will be making changes to this as we get closer to the end of the year, we see what actual expenditures were for 2023 so that we can project forward into 2024, as well as we get final numbers on pledges and other uh, anticipated revenue for 2024 as well. So these numbers will change. This is just a, a beginning point uh, where we've taken our, our best effort year to date and thought this might be where we go uh, forward in 2024. What we're budgeting at this point, again, very loosely as terms of proposal, uh, is total revenue of $526,500, of which we anticipate pledges to make up $459,950. Just to show how important pledges are to the overall uh, health of our finances here. In terms of total expenditures, we have $531,200. 
When you add and subtract, like I've been saying so far, you will see that net revenue is a negative number. And that means that the budgeted or anticipated revenue is less than what we expect to spend in 2024. And that is not likely to change in terms of its positive or negative aspect. I'll refer you back to what I said earlier in terms of the excess cash reserves. So if you want to flip back a page to the bottom of the balance sheet, recall that we keep three months of cash reserves on hand for the payment of anticipated expenses. And then we have this $109,421 in excess cash. The conversations with the vestry so far this year and briefly referring back to Father Andy's comments of how the uh, Children and Families um, Ministries coordinator position was crafted, it was intentionally and thoughtfully decided by the, by the vestry that we will dip into that excess cash reserves in order to fund that position. So mathematically, what's shown on the budget indicates that that's what we will be doing. That $11,650, or whatever that final number will be, will be covered by excess cash reserves that we already have on hand. So this was done intentionally to use some of the funds that have been gifted over the years as an intentional investment in the years to come in the development of that position. Uh, let's see. I think that's everything I need to talk about this morning. Um, Oh, uh, the discussion that we just had regarding the Newell House and the costs of whatever is decided, they are not part of this budget because at this point, we don't know what we're budgeting for. So just in case anybody is wondering about that, that's not part of this budget, but this budget will be updated. The vestry can update throughout the year. And when those changes are made, they'll be communicated to you in terms of a revision to this current budget after this actual budget is adopted in January. Okay, now I'm done. Any Thank questions? You. Okay. Well, I just you, want to reiterate what Kevin said, that the word draft needs to be applied to this document in all caps and in a font twice the size as the rest of the numbers in it. We are required by our bylaws to approve the budget by February 15th. <clears throat> and our practice has been to approve the budget at the last vestry meeting or at the vestry meeting in January. So we have from now until the end of January to make adjustments, to tweak, to gather more data and more information um, so that the budget that we finalize at the end of January is a true reflection of our projected revenues, our projected expenses, and our values and our mission going forward. Um, you all have the opportunity to participate in that conversation at any vestry meeting and by contacting any member of the vestry or Kevin or myself, and we will take your concerns or your questions to the vestry, or you can come to those meetings yourself. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that you, you have lots of time left um, to give us input. I also want to note that it is now 1023, and the next service is scheduled to start in seven minutes. <laughs> Andy Porter is barring the door, keeping people from coming in back there because they're chomping at the bit to come in and find a seat in the front row for the next service. So any questions that you had this morning that you did not have the opportunity to ask, if you will send them to me, we will answer those questions and publish both the questions and the answers in the Friday e-news next week. Um, you haven't lost the opportunity to engage. We're just going to have to call for an overtime session here and let that happen over the next couple of weeks. Thank you all very much. Um, if you would leave your red and green voting cards on the back window sills of the nave, we'll collect them up. And the next time we need a two-thirds majority um, vote for something, we will reuse them. In the meantime, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the community gathered here in your name, for the work that you have given us to do, and for our response to your call. We give you thanks 
for the people here, our family and our friends in this community. And above all, we give you thanks for the grace, love, and light that you shower upon us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all very much.